right, let's go ahead and open up to Romans. Yeah, today we're going to start cl closing. Uh, I wrote in my email this morning, kind of landing the plane of Romans. We've been up there. I was going to check when we started Romans, but I forgot to do that. But I think it's been four or five years now we've been in Romans. Uh, and a lot of people have said how grateful they are for that, and they've learned so many things. So that's the key. Uh, that's the, it's not, the goal isn't to get through the books quickly. Uh, it's to learn them uh, and to get these foundational truths in God's word. Uh, and so we're ready to bring down the plane. We've reached the high point. Uh, I guess maybe if we switch to a climbing metaphor, we've climbed up the mountain of the book of Romans. And in chapters 14 and 15, as we scaled the peak, uh, and we really uh, got the information we need and in, in Christianity as a whole needs to solve all their problems. Actually, it's enough to solve the problems of the whole world. Uh, but if they just applied what we learned in chapters 14 and 15, chapters 14 and 15 have, give, supply the answer to everything. They are going to, they gave us, we've seen this already, uh, this is just a little bit of a review as we finish off chapter 15, but they would be the answer to every question, the solution to every problem, the alleviator of all errors and confusion uh, that have corrupted and come to characterize uh, much of historical Christianity. In Romans 14, we saw here's uh, the, the modus operandi. Uh, and of course, in Romans 15, they have an excusable situation. They're confused. Do we follow God's word through Moses? God's word through Moses says there's all kinds of unclean food. Don't eat any of them. And if you do, it's going to affect your relationship with me. God's word through Paul now comes along, and he says there's nothing unclean. Everything's pure. You can eat whatever you want, and, not, and it doesn't affect your relationship with me. So they got, you see the problem? They have a legitimate problem, especially those with a str strong Jewish background. We'll even see it today, kind of incidentally. This clean, unclean thing uh, is an important thing in Israel's prophetic program. And so the question is, do, we follow, do uh, these people follow God's word through Moses, or do they follow God's word through Paul? You can't really do it both, right? You can't say there's, uh, at, there's a whole bunch of unclean things and at the same time say there's nothing unclean. I mean, they really don't go together. You've got to pick one or the other. So what are you going to do? I remember uh, hearing some radio teacher on the, on the radio, and he said what uh, he rightly divides. And he says, so what most of Christianity does, they just take it, it's like leftovers from your refrigerator, gather them all together, throw it in the blender, a hit go, uh, and they try and make a meal out of that. And it doesn't work. It's just a mess. And that's the way his, most of historic Christianity has been. How do you pick? Uh, do we follow God's word in his prophetic program with Israel? Do we follow God's word through Paul and his mystery program for the body of Christ? They won't go together. You've got to pick. So what can you do? Well, what are you going to do? You're going to follow God's word uh, through Moses on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, and then God's word through Paul on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and then toss a coin on Sundays. I mean, it's ridiculous, and that's the state of Christianity. And he says here now, he, in chapters 14 and 15, we saw how you know what our instruction manual for today is. And that comes from following Paul, and we're not going to go look at these verses again. We covered these uh, completely over the last couple months, uh, but I just wanted to put up here step by step. You, want, you have a problem in the assembly, you have a problem in your Christian life, follow Paul is the first step, because he's the one following Christ. Walking in love, in the context of Pauline grace mystery truth, the realm we're in today, the kingdom of God we're involved today, the righteousness and life, the peace and reconciliation, uh, the joy and victory in the spirit, uh, that's an outline of Romans 1 to 8. Uh, and the, he talks about that in Romans 14, in the light, in the context, in the realm of Pauline grace mystery truth, and holding that faith, our faith, in the faith of Christ, the faithful work of Christ on that cross that produces our faithful walk, hold all that faith in the presence of God in constant prayerful communion with God. And then, it's only after at that point, 
It's, it, you can't really serve God until you've done these things. This sets the groundwork. Once you're following God's word through what God's accomplishing through the Apostle Paul, walk, taking it, walking in love, in accord with following grace, mystery, truth, in the presence of God, then you're ready to serve then you're ready to uh, carry out some things God wants done. And that leads us into Romans, I didn't put it here, but that leads us into Romans 15. Now, the strong in the faith who are following Paul, walking in love, holding that faith uh, in accord with Pauline grace, mystery, truth, uh, holding that faith in the presence of God, uh, prayerfully communing with God about that, now you're in the state where God can use you. And he's going to use them now. Uh, and, and when they're being used in that way, there's a door open welcoming everybody to welcome them, the pe all people the way Christ welcomes all people, including your enemies. Remember, what's the key pivotal thing we get from Pauline Grace Mystery Truth? It's that agape love that is the love of God at the cross of Christ whereby he died for his enemies. Now, if you go to John, you won't see that love. The love in John, John expressly says, God sent his son, I uh, love the world enough to send his son, but he didn't love the world enough to die for it. He sent his son to die for his friends in John, John 15, 13. If you want to have your most basic uh, problem solved, because uh, we're born into the world as ungodly sinners on enemy status before God, you have to learn about that. It's manifested, it's revealed through Paul. And John, you're going to learn Christ died for his friends. That's a great love. That is a wonderful love. That's an exceedingly abundant love, especially when you realize it's God who came down to do that. Uh, it's an extreme love. That's the love in the triunity, in the trinity. That's the love between the members of the trinity. Uh, the, they love each other. They serve each other. Uh, that love in the trinity. But you know there's a love that isn't revealed in the trinity or in the, uh, in the gospel of John or any of the uh, non-Pauline scriptures. There's a love that can't be displayed in the trinity or in the, uh, to his friends. And that's a love he displays to his enemies. See, there's no enemies in the triunity of God. Uh, the, and he died for his friends in the, in the gospel accounts. But today he's putting on a display a love that goes way beyond that. It's that he died for his enemies. An amazing love. We've been over that many times. Then you'll be welcoming all people, you'll be participating in their edification, not considering one's own things, but the things of others under their edification. Uh, and that will enable us in verses 5 to 7 to praise God together with one mind and one mouth uh, with a God-given like-mindedness. Not a pretend like-mindedness like, like uh, we all uh, try to get through our little churches and our little denominations and uh, go to camp and all this kind of stuff. Uh, this is a God-given like-mindedness, not a pretend like-mindedness. This only comes if we have a like-mindedness, to get the like-mindedness Christ gives, so we have one mind and one mouth can praise him, and there's only one way you can get that. There's only one way to have a God-given unity. And that comes from rightly dividing the scriptures. And we saw that in verses 8 to 16 then. And when you're rightly dividing the scriptures, uh, and this is where we left off last time, when you're rightly dividing the scriptures, you'll appreciate that what God's doing through, uh, through the apostleship and ministry of Paul. And we're, that's an important thing to pick up here. Today, God has, used, has opened up a new avenue of hope, a new avenue of blessings to the world, especially the Gentiles, through the Apostle Paul, apart from Israel, without the works of the law, and through Israel's fall. Something never, and that was something that had never been revealed before till the Apostle Paul. And that brings us where we left off, once you're uh, engaged in this process in chapter 14 and 15, it's the solution to everything. 
It would solve all the problems. It would clear up all the confusions. Uh, it would clear up everything. Uh, and that's where we left off. That's where we're going to go from here now. Uh, if all of this was uh, carried out, you know what you'd find out about all those things, all those theological systems, all those religious systems we think are so big. You know, you see them on TV, on the radio. You see them all over the place, those big seminaries. You know what they do if, the, if you follow these two chapters 14 and 15? You know what would happen with all those systems? They vanish, poof. They're nothing. We think they're something, but they're nothing. Apart from God's way of doing it, they're nothing. They're going to vanish into a unity and a like-mindedness to praise God with one mind and one mouth. Uh, and that's what's going to come out of Romans 14 and 15. We think they're such big things, uh, but they're really a vain religious system. Those Christian religions, mostly apostate Christian religions, all those denominations broken up, divided, fighting each other, uh, who have left, uh, who for the most part have thrown away Paul's distinct apostleship, all that kind of stuff. See, that's just, we think it's something there, but there's not. It's, just, it's like being out in the desert and seeing a mirage. The closer you get to it, the further it goes back, and it just poof, disappears. And what the world would be left with, what Christianity would be left with, is a unity based on a God-given like-mindedness where the whole body of Christ would be praising God together with one mind and one mouth. And what they're going to be praising God about is we go back here, is chap verses 14 to 19. They're going to be praising God about being the participants in his infinitely great grace that he's dispensing through Paul's distinct apostleship. That's what everyone would be doing. You go walk into any church, you, I, I think you'd have, be hard-pressed hard, hard pressed, uh, to find uh, people gathered around uh, Pauline Grace Mystery Truth, worshiping God in that way. But that's the way, that's the only way that's going to bring true unity. You know, uh, this is what's going to be happening at that judgment seat and into eternity, where the whole body of Christ standing behind Paul is going to be praising God, worshiping God with a God-given like minus one, one mind, one mouth, praising God that they are the beneficiaries of what he's accomplished through the apostleship and ministry of Paul. And that brings us now to uh, where we are in the rest of chapter 15. And I'm just going to close out chapters 15 and 16 here over the next couple weeks. And I'm going to uh, kind of put it under a new title uh, as we finished off, we can pretty much ended at verse 19, 18, 19 in chapter 15. And uh, as we wrap up chapters 15 and 16, here's the main uh, overriding kind of uh, theme that I'm going to bring out. And that's Paul, the gap closer. He's going to start closing all the, I was thinking, you know, I was thinking I could maybe just tie together the loose ends, but they're really not loose ends. What he's going to do is he's going to take all these things, all these people he's been involved with, and he's going to bring them all together. You know what he's going to do? He's going to do what we were just talking about over in Romans 15. Look at Romans 15, verse 5 and 6. Now the God of patience He's, Paul is going to now come as the gap closer. He's going to go to all these different people and he's going to bring them together, giving them a like-mindedness toward one another according to Christ, that they with one mind and one mouth may glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to be the gap closer. Uh, we've already seen one gap he's closed, and, uh, and it's in chapter 14. I'm not going back to chapter 14, uh, but he closed the gap. What was the gap in chapter 14? You had the weak in the faith believer and the strong in the faith believer, and they were fighting. They were dividing. They were uh, separating. They were being unwelcoming. They were despising. They were ridiculing. They were being unwelcoming. Uh, they were uh, throwing each other away, treating them as nothing. Paul now, well, that's what we've been studying the last few weeks, he's brought together the weak in the faith and the strong in the faith and brought them together, the gap closer. 
Now when we get into ch the rest of chapter 15 and on into chapter 16, he's going to close a bunch of other gaps. There's other gaps. What we're going to see next in Romans 15, 20 to 33, uh, he's going to uh, close the gap between the believing remnant of Israel, uh, especially those in Jerusalem under Peter and the 12. Of course, there's not 12 still at this point, but Peter uh, and the authority of the 12. Uh, and they're in Jerusalem, and they're in extreme poverty. Now, why are they in extreme poverty? All Jerusalem wasn't in extreme poverty, but this, uh, the believing remnant of Israel was in extreme poverty. Why? Well, it's because God set aside their program. He said, because of Israel's rejection of Christ, their program was set aside. He began this new program through the Apostle Paul. And now having their program set aside, his, it was diminishing. It would be off the, off the, off the scene. Uh, and they were suffering uh, from poverty because of that. He's going to close the gap between the body of Christ and the believing remnant of Israel. Uh, he's going to have, we're going to read in the next verses, and probably next week, he's going to have all many of those assemblies he's got that's far flung and dispersed throughout the world there. He's going to get them together uh, and he's going to get them to contribute to a gift that will alleviate the poverty for this believing remnant in Jerusalem. But what's he do at the same time? So we have the gap. The, he's already dealt with the weak in the faith and the strong in the faith. He's brought them together. He's going to bring the believing, uh, excuse me, the body of Christ and the believing remnant of Israel together through this gift. And while he's bringing together the body of Christ and the believing remnant through this gift, he's involving all those assemblies that he's been, uh, he's been planting throughout the world. And what's he doing with them? He's bringing them together. He's giving them a common project to work on. Gather together a connection, a collection, uh, for the believers in Rome. Excuse me, the believers in Jerusalem. The believing remnant in Jerusalem. Then in chapter 16, we're going to see he's going to close out the book and he's going to close the gap between himself and the Romans. Remember, he hadn't been to Rome. Uh, only he was there uh, indirectly through his co-workers. So he's going to, at the end of chapter, six, chapter 16, is going to lead to him closing the gap between himself and the Romans uh, through this epistle, this book to the, this letter to the Romans, and through his co-workers. Paul's co-workers went to Rome uh, and preached Paul's message, and some people there believed. And now they were their co-workers. The people who were Paul's co-workers are now the Romans, the believers in Rome's co-workers as well. And he's going to close that gap. And so when you get to the end of chapter 16, you have this perfect uh, unity and a perfect, uh, perfect completion to the most important book probably uh, in the history of the world. All right. So we're just going to look at now, we're going to talk tonight to this morning about Paul uh, and where he's been uh, and what he's looking at. I guess we'll get rid of that. Uh, so here's a map. I just just to kind of give you an idea. Let's read the verses here now. This is let's pick it up at verse 19. Romans 15:19. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that through uh, so that from Jerusalem, which is way over here. Where is Jerusalem? Here's Jerusalem. And then out to Illyricum. Where is Illyricum? And now he goes clear over here. That's Illyricum up there. What's Illyricum right across the sea from? Rome. Paul's covered this whole ter territory. He's left Jerusalem, and he's covered this, gone up to Antioch. He's gone all the way through Asia Minor and this whole area. He's gone up into here, all, all the way through here, and, not, and all the way to Illyricum. And he just needs to get on a boat, and he'd be in Rome. But there's, he's going to do something else first, so let's keep reading. So he, this is, this is he, hopefully this map shows you this is a huge area. This is a huge area. He's, he's already uh, planted churches throughout this area. You have Antioch, you have uh, Ephesus, Colossae, you have 
Thessalonica, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, you have Corinth, uh, you have uh, just a massive amount of assemblies that he's planted in this, in this, such, this uh, area. And now in Romans 15, oops, now in Romans 15, he's up on this peak and he's looking down at what he's done. And he's uh, preached Christ all the way to Illyric, all the way to the border of Rome. Basically, the whole Eastern Roman Empire he's covered. Now, look what he's going to do next. Uh, verse 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it, as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you, but now having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, Whensoever I take my journey, so he wants to go to them. He's been as far as Illyricum. To get to Rome, you just cross the Adriatic Sea, but he's going to do something else first. And he says here, whensoever, verse 24, I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, the Romans, uh, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way there by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company, but... Verse 25, now I go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Uh, so he's all the way here. He's looking down on the whole vast area. He's planted churches. And, of course, each of those churches he planted, then they, he's left behind some men who could teach, and they went and told their neighbors and their friends and their relatives and spread it, and they're growing in this area. He's planting these things all the way along. He's all the way, been all the way out in one way or another to Illyricum. He's planning on going to Rome and then Spain. And some people say uh, he even went up to Great Britain. I don't know the validity of that, but I've, some people say that. So, uh, but first, before he goes to Rome, he's going to come back because he's going to do a collection for the believing remnant of Israel that's in Jerusalem who's suffering poverty because their program is shut down. And we'll look at that uh, next time. Today I just want to look at uh, this idea of Paul's foundation. He's taught the book of Romans. See, it's important uh, to understand that he's taught the book of Romans all these places. He's been going person by, uh, in person to all these locations, and what's he teaching there? He's teaching the book of Romans. He's doing it verbally in person. Uh, the book hasn't been actually written down yet, but he's teaching the truths of Romans. You get, he, now he's done this whole vast area. Eastern Roman Empire has uh, totally uh, had church plantings. He, he's up in Illyricum. And he's in Corinth, actually, when he writes Romans, but he's reached as far as Illyricum in his ministry. And he's going to now, what's he going to do? He's going to write down. He's been practicing Romans all the way through this area, all those different churches. He keeps giving Romans, uh, and he's practicing it, getting it just right. And now he writes Romans, and he writes it down and records it for eternal posterity and sends it to Rome. And here we are, 2,000 years later, studying the book of Romans. He takes all that and, and uh, he records it in this book of Romans, all that stuff he taught uh, those uh, churches along the way, and now we have it recorded in here. And he's going to send it to Rome, and he's going to present it to them. All right, so let's just look at a couple things here. We want to look at the foundation uh, concept. I know that's a lot of words in that slide. Uh, I didn't notice that one earlier, but I see that there's a lot of words in it now. I tend to be wordy in my slides, so you're probably used to it. But let's go ahead, and we're, today we're going to look at this foundation of Paul. Very important concept. Notice he says here, uh, verse 20, Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Now, it's important to realize, I should probably have said this a minute ago when we were talking about how Paul had taught Romans to, truths to all those churches. Uh, now Rome is going to get the book of Romans. Uh, and 
for those assemblies who have the book of Romans, either through Paul's personal ministry, teaching it to them directly in person, or through this letter, uh, or copies thereof, uh, if they leave Romans truth, you know what Paul does? He comes down with a ma uh, uh, sledgehammer and whacks them. Here's one of the things he's going to whack the Corinthians for. The Corinthians know Romans truth. And when you he read here about this foundation Paul is building on, he's not going to build on anyone else's foundation. He has his own foundation. Guess how the book of 1 Corinthians is going to open up not too long after it opens up. You got a chapter called 1 Corinthians 3 that guess what he sledgehammers the Corinthians with? They're building with a, either they're building on the wrong foundation or they're building on Paul's foundation with the wrong materials. And that's what he's bringing out here. Every one of these points, if you reject some truth in Romans, you got to go to Corinthians and Galatians. And there he corrects them who've left Romans truth. Uh, so he's going to earnestly desire to preach the gospel of Christ to those who did not name or glorify Christ through the ministry of Peter and the Twelve because Israel abrogated its responsibility by rejecting Christ. Remember, Peter and the Twelve never left Jerusalem. In Acts 15, years later, where's Peter? He's still in Jerusalem. I'll never forget one day, I, I always have lived a long way from all my jobs, and I had to drive like an hour each time. And I, so I got a lot of listening to the radio. And I remember listening to J. Vernon McGee, pretty good, Acts 2 dispensationalist, who maybe tends towards the Pauline side rather than the reform side. So we give him some credit there. And he came out and he uh, said this. He said, the reason why Peter and the rest of the 12, whichever ones were alive still at that point, why they were still in Jerusalem is because they were rebelling against God, rejecting his word, and refused to do what God told them to do and go out to the Gentiles because they were prejudiced and bigoted Jews who refused to do that. So God had to raise up Paul to go do what they should have done. And uh, I think I've told this story before, but my wife's lucky, maybe not so lucky, but I, the steering wheel, and I almost crashed into a tree because I found it such a shocking thing for it to come out of uh, someone's mouth. Uh, but I did get back on the road, uh, and I, that, is, actually, that is just Gentile arrogance. That's just nonsense. Peter and the 12 were in Jerusalem because they were completely obedient to God. In their program, God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel, first Jerusalem, the leaders of Israel, first the, in order for God to use the nation Israel, first the leaders of Israel had to receive Christ. But we know from the Acts account, the leaders in Jerusalem didn't receive Christ. That shut down Peter's program. He couldn't go out to the world. Peter's program was supposed to be, you're supposed to be, the, the uh, Jerusalem leadership would be saved. They'd go out to Judea and the sister uh, territory of Galilee and, pre, and get them to accept Christ. And then the Jerusalem, Judea, and Galilee would all come together and go to Samaria, and then all Israel would be saved. But it, the Jerusalem leaders threw a wrench in the machine. They refuse their Christ, their Messiah, their King. And it shut down the system. Peter and the 12 are still in Jerusalem because they're still trying to get the Jerusalem leaders to receive Christ. Otherwise, they can't go anywhere else. So go with the Bible. Don't go with J. Vernon McGee on that one. Point being, there's this whole world now. We talked about this in, Ro in uh, Romans 15. There's this whole world out there now that's supposed to be receiving God's light and blessings and salvation through Israel. But Israel has stumbled and fallen. Where does that leave the world? Go back to verse chapter 15. Look at how he says this. I think we counted five times. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to show you here. Go look at verse 9. 
uh, uh, Romans 15, 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles and sing unto, uh, and sing unto thy name. Israel is supposed to confess Christ to the Gentiles, singing uh, praises of his name to the Gentiles. They're supposed to be taking Christ out to the Gentiles. Verse 10, he says it again and again, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Israel is supposed to take Christ out to the Gentiles so that the Gentiles can worship and praise God together with Israel. And again, praise ye the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Israel's prophetic program is supposed to be restored Israel, taking out God's light, glory, blessing, taking Christ out to the Gentiles. But Israel... And the 12 are still sitting in Jerusalem because Jerusalem, Israel, rejected Christ. It shut down their program. The only hope the Gentiles had was that they would be, could participate in the blessings through Israel. But Israel's crash landed and it was cast away temporarily, but nevertheless cast away. And what did we learn in chapter 15? That caused the God of hope to kick into action. Look at verse 13. We read down through verse 12. Now look at verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you. Well, Paul, how can the God of hope fill them if you just told them their only way they can participate in God's blessings had crash landed? Well, it's because the God of hope opened a new way of blessing. And it's the apostleship of Paul. And he's building on that foundation. That's the foundation he's going to build on. So building on the wrong foundation, you see this uh, explicitly in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, building on the wrong foundation, that displeases God, or building on the right foundation but with the wrong materials, uh, that displeases God as well. Whether it, uh, P, we see uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, and we see in Galatians 2, excuse me, Galatians 2, remember what Peter did? Peter went to Antioch. Now, what's Antioch? Antioch's an assembly of Paul's. He goes to Antioch, and he, what does he start doing on Paul's foundation? He starts putting up a wall. It's called the unclean and unclean things, kind of like what we were talking about in Romans 14. He starts erecting a wall on Paul's foundation that's separating uh, clean from unclean, which means clean and unclean foods. And what's the point of that? If there's clean and unclean foods, then there's clean and unclean people because people eat the food. So now you got clean and unclean, and you, he starts building a wall between the Jews and the Gentiles again. But it's on Paul's foundation. And you know what Paul does in Galatians 2? You can read it. We're not going to turn there. He comes with a sledgehammer just like he did to the Corinthians. You fools. And he withstood Peter to the face. How dare you put a wall on my foundation that doesn't belong on my foundation. It belongs on Peter's foundation, but not on my foundation. And he whacks that wall down and throws it off the foundation you don't believe is that dramatic, read Galatians 2. God, through Paul, withstood Peter, uh, and really it's James and John, they're all in that group there, to face this for doing in Antioch what uh, they tried to build on Paul's foundation with the wrong materials, the clean and unclean food regulations, trying to re-erect uh, the wall between Jews and Gentiles that was appropriate on Peter's foundation, but is not appropriate on Paul's foundation. Paul is the official servant, look at verse 16, Romans 15, 16, that I should be the minister. The word for minister there isn't the usual word for minister. It's the same word used over in chapter 13 where it talked about official government appointees or official government uh, uh, officials. Uh, and that's what Paul is. He's the official, God-given, official, uh, designated, appointed minister of what God's doing today. And what's he doing today? He's going out, he's providing Christ and his blessings to the world apart from Israel through her fall without the works of the law, 
the clean and unclean food regulations being one, one set of those. Uh, and he's offering up the Gentiles now with a perfect, righteous standing, not based on any of that, but based solely on the personal work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross for them. And it's a clean offering, a perfect offering, a, righteous, a fully righteous offering that God fully accepts without the works of the law. And then he goes on and he's going to quote here with that background. This verse should hopefully make a little more sense then. Verse 21. Verse 21. But as it is written, to whom he was, so now it's written, he's quoting from Isaiah 52. But as it is written, to whom he, has, he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand. Uh, so, of course, this is Isaiah. So, I think this would be a good uh, point. Let's go back to Isaiah. We'll be back to Romans 15. But go back to Isaiah 52. And I thought this might be one of those opportunities. We've spent so much time uh, showing how uh, to rightly divide the scriptures. This might be a good time to show you. Probably no one here has really read Isaiah 52 in a while. I know I hadn't in a while. We're just going to read through his. The actual, the only verse we really need that Paul's quoting is at the end of the chapter. But I just want to show you, uh, if you've been following this a little bit, uh, you can understand your Bible. I'm not going to say you're going to understand every detail, every reference, every innuendo, every, uh, but I'm saying you can follow it. Uh, and so what I thought we'd do, Isaiah 52 is a pretty short chapter, so I thought we would just read through it using our, let's go back to our timeline here. Oh, I thought my timeline was sooner than that. Uh, here's our timeline. Remember, when you're in Isaiah, Isaiah knows nothing about the dispensation of grace. Isaiah knows nothing about this. The timeline Isaiah sees is Daniel's timeline uh, and Jeremiah's timeline and Daniel's timeline, and it's this timeline. There's no dispensation of grace. I just read a commentator. He says, the dispensation of grace is hidden. The secret, the mystery is hidden in the Old Testament. And now it's just, well, of course, if it's in the Old Testament, that's not really hidden, right? Well, then he realizes that it's not really hidden if it's there. Uh, and so he says, so it's just made known more completely now. See, that's more of that just nonsense of nonsense theological systems because you know what Paul tells us in Ephesians 3? He tells us in Ephesians 3 that the, uh, that the mystery... His, this dispensation of grace, what God's doing today through the apostleship of Paul, wasn't hid in the Old Testament. You know where Paul says it was hid? It was hid in God in eternity past. And it wasn't revealed until God directly revealed it to Paul. It's not hidden in the Old Testament. It's not uh, there in a kind of a hidden, misty, cloudy way, and now we just, the clouds have cleared, and now we see it better. Uh, it was hidden God, Paul says, in Ephesians 3. So this is the timeline. This is the, the major points in Israel's history. If you just know these things, these five courses of punishment, remember Isaiah, he's writing in the fourth course of punishment. There's five of them. So he's, they're just getting ready to go into the fifth course of punishment. And uh, so when you come to Isaiah, when you open up the book, you, and you know where Isaiah is roughly on this uh, timeline as a, as a fourth uh, course of punishment prophet, now you know what he's going to be talking about. I remember reading a book oh, quite a while ago uh, on uh, American history, and, and somebody had written this whole chapter about how uh, when it talks about the northern and southern kingdom in Israel, uh, it's really referring, it's prophetic outlook of the northern, uh, north and south in the Civil War. And I about fell off my chair. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. See, if you start playing games with the Bible like that, then you're not really interested in God and his word and just admit it and move on. Uh, he, Isaiah is in the fourth course of punishment, so what's he going to be talking about? He's not going to be talking about the American Civil War or anything going on in the world today. He's going to be talking about things in his day. It's going to open up, and you can just, just looking at this timeline, you'll know everything Isaiah is going to be talking about. Uh, you may not understand every specific detail and how it, you know, but you're going to know what he's talking about. He's going to open it up, and what's he going to be talking about? He's going to be describing the people of his own day. 
and how they're worthy, because of their rebellion, they're worthy to receive the fifth course of punishment. And he's going to tell them, repent and return to the Lord, and you don't need to go into that fifth course of punishment. If you don't repent and return to the Lord, you'll go into the fifth course of punishment. So that's what he's doing. That's how the book's going to open. Uh, of course, uh, we know that they don't obey, they don't repent and return to the Lord, and they go into the fifth course of punishment. Uh, and so just before the fifth course of punishment, he, you have the Assyrian captivity that carries off the northern kingdom. So guess what the next thing Isaiah talks about, a big block of information, the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom. Then you're going to read the first installment of the fifth course of punishment is the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom. Guess what the next block of information, big block of information Isaiah gives? The Babylonian captivity. And you can go through. Then he gives a big section after the Babylonian captivity. He talks about Medo-Persian reign. He names Cyrus, uh, the, the leader of the, of the Persians, uh, and he names him 100 or 200 years before he comes on the scene. And he gives a big block of information about that. And you just go through. That's what Isaiah is talking about. And then he's going to give a big block, a block of information on the silence. God's going to stop hearing uh, Israel. He's not going to hear their prayers of the apostate part of Israel anyway. He's going to go back to his place 400 years. He's going to break the silence with John the Baptist uh, at the fourth installment. That's Christ's earthly ministry. And then guess what? You get a big block of information, which is where we're going to read from tonight uh, in Isaiah, having to do with Christ's earthly ministry. Then the final thing is that seven-year Daniel, seven-year, uh, what we typically call the tribulation period, and on into the kingdom. Guess how the book of, Dan, or, uh, book of Isaiah ends? By describing that tribulation period and entrance into the kingdom. That's what the book of Isaiah is about. So we're going to pick it up here in Isaiah 52. And here he's going to uh, be looking ahead. Uh, and this is especially in a block of information about the earthly ministry of Christ. Uh, but it looks back. It's going to look forward. And now let's just open this up and read this. Uh, it's going to start with a, with a uh, vision, I guess you could say. Verse 1. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Now, Zion uh, is another name for Jerusalem and kind of expands out from that. But on the, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. You know why there were Jews uh, with Jewish background in Rome worried about clean and unclean? Because they knew passages like this. He's looking ahead now. When Christ returns, he's going to call them out of the Gentile nations. And you know what there he's going to tell them to do? Don't bring anything unclean. All those foods, all those, leave them in your Gentile, in the Gentile areas. And he's going to call them out and bring them in that kingdom. And they better not come with anything unclean. See why that's a problem in Romans 14? Hopefully we made that clear. So he's looking out here at the king, the return of Christ and entrance into that kingdom. They're not, their enemies, it says, uh, they're not going to no more come into thee. Uh, the uncircumcised, that's the Gentiles, and the unclean. They're not going to come attack them. Remember, they're under the, in this fifth course of punishment, they're under Gentile rule. First the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Medo-Persians, then the Greeks and the Romans, and they're going to be on the same thing out here. And he, said, he promises them when he returns and ushers in that kingdom, the Gentiles aren't going to rule over you anymore. Verse 2, shake thyself, and just kind of use your imagination. Here we are in the kingdom. He's to, uh, he, uh, Jerusalem is completely destroyed, and he's just... Come out of the ashes. Come up out of the dust, Jerusalem. He's going to raise up Jerusalem again. And clothe her. We read it with a beautiful garment. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down. O Jerusalem, loose, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. He's going to break the bands, and they're just going to have to fling them off. O captive daughter of Zion, for thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for nothing. Now he goes back. Here we have this little vignette of the kingdom, what's going to happen out here in the kingdom. Now he goes back to the beginning. You sold yourself for nothing. He was carried off into the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity and entered that fifth course of punishment. For thus saith the Lord, 
and my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without a cause. The Assyrian, now he goes all the way back to Egypt. The Pharaoh at that time was, was associated uh, as an Assyrian, and he, he uh, persecuted them. Remember the whole Exodus story? Well, there's going to be another Exodus, an infinitely greater Exodus out here. That exodus from Egypt back in their ancient history, here it's going to be an exodus out of the world that's going to destroy the satanic system. Verse 5, now therefore, what have I here? Oh, no, we got to go back to verse 3. And ye shall be redeemed without money. They're going to be, that refers to this cross. They're going to be redeemed without money. What's, how are they going to be redeemed? They're going to be redeemed by Christ who's going to come and redeem them. The Lord's going to come and redeem them. Now therefore, verse 5, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for nothing? They that rule over them make them to howl, said the Lord. And my name continually blasphemed, uh, continually every day is blasphemed. So this whole time now, they're going to be under Gentile overlording. They're, and what, they're going to be under a vain religious system. It's under the Gentiles. That's under Satan. That's who's ruling in Israel's prophetic program during this uh, fifth course of punishment. And he says here, every day they're blaspheming. It's an interesting thing here, but keep your finger here, but just go to uh, Romans. This is true. This blaspheming among the Gentiles is true even in Paul's day. Go to Romans 2. We'll just look at this real quick because I think it's good to see these correlations here. Romans 2 Verse 23, thou that makest thy boast of the law, the, the Israel, the Jews, thou through breaking the law dishonorest God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Uh, what began back here in these captivities that, called to, uh, that brought disrepute to Israel's God uh, continues all the way through, is going to continue through here, uh, and is going to end in his return. Therefore, my people, verse 6, shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. One day they're going to know his name. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings, that publisheth peace, and bringeth good tidings of good, and publisheth salvation. Uh, where did you read, where have we read that, that quoted? In the gospel accounts. That is publishing the kingdom God, the gospel of the kingdom, publishing that good news, publishing it to the world. The king is here and the kingdom's at hand. Uh, Zion unto Zion, thy God reigneth. But what did they do with that good news back here? They rejected it. So the reigning of the king was put in abeyance. Uh, that's going to be re occur out here uh, at the end time. The watchmen shall lift up thy voice, with the voice together shall they sing, they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Uh, break forth into joy. Now we're back at a picture in the kingdom again, Christ's return and that ushering into that kingdom. Bring, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people and hath redeemed Jerusalem. Redemption, deliverance. Avengement, they was going to deliver Israel, believing Israel, and destroy the enemies and usher them into that kingdom to be their king and their blesser. Verse 10, the Lord hath made bare his holy arm. That means he's powerfully working. That's the deliverance and avengement aspect. Break, uh, the Lord hath made bare his holy, arm, his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. When this happens, the whole world is going to see the salvation of God. It's not going to be a hidden thing. It's going to be everyone's going to see it. Verse 11, he's going to save his friends and destroy all his enemies and establish his return to establish that kingdom. And he's going to call out the Jews, the believing, believing remnant of Israel, those believing Jews, they're out among the nations, and he's going to call them out of the nations. Look what it says in verse 11. He's going to return, and he's going to say, come to me, come to me. 
and these Jews that have been uh, enslaved in their Gentile territories are going to come out. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from hence. Touch no unclean thing. Here we have that unclean, clean thing again. Go ye out of the midst of her, and be ye clean that bear vessels of the Lord, for you shall not go out in haste or in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your re reward in our King James, that's your gatherer. He's going to gather them together. He's going to call them out of their graves among the Gentiles, regather them and usher them into the kingdom uh, and plant them in the land. Make Israel the head of the nation so that she can be a conduit of God's light and blessings to the whole world, to the Gentiles. Verse 13. Now he's going to go, and so he culminates it here, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. That's going to be at his second coming. But what happens before that? Verse 14. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. More than the sons of men. Uh, they were back to this redemption concept again. Christ, his suffering and death on that cross, marred more than any other man. But he's going to have died, he rose again, going to, and is exalted, and is going to return to usher in that kingdom and make Israel the conduit of blessings to the Gentiles. So shall, and we read this in verse 15, so shall he sprinkle, uh, preach, the, Israel's going to sprinkle, uh, going to preach Christ, sprinkle many nations, the kings shall shut their mouths at him. And here's our verse from Romans 15. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall consider. Now we can't, we can't stop there. We have to read one more verse. Here we are, we're at the pinnacle. Here he's telling the one he suffered, he's been uh, resurrected, he's been extolled, glorified, raised up. He's going to return and call out the believing remnant from all the uh, nations, regather them together, bring them into the land. And then he's going to raise up Israel, recreate Israel out of that believing remnant in the land, and he's going to sprinkle the nations through the nation of Israel. But what happens? Here's the key. This is what we learned in Romans 10, verse 1 of 53. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Uh, what didn't happen back here? None of this uh, uh, latter time things happened there because Israel rejected Christ. Who has believed our report? The report of the uh, beautiful feet of Peter and the 12 and the believing remnant preaching the gospel of the kingdom and proclaiming that uh, Christ's earthly ministry. John the Baptist preaching that gospel of the kingdom, proclaiming it, and nobody believed it. Even when God gave them a one-year extension of grace and through the Spirit preached it again to them. In early Acts, they rejected it again. Israel rejected it again. Years later, Peter is still in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is still rejecting it. So here's the problem. How are the nations going to be sprinkled if Israel is, not a, is the only conduit of those blessings and preaching of Christ was supposed to be through Israel. Israel stumbled and fell and was cast away. How are the nations going to be sprinkled today? And that brings us back to Romans 15. And we'll close uh, with this. Romans 15. Romans 15. And now we come back, so he quotes this. At the very point Israel was supposed to assume her duty, is going to assume her duty one day, and be the proclaimer of Christ to the world, to the Gentiles. At the very point that happened, but Israel refused to do it, and, uh, her, and she broke up and fell apart and was cast aside. At that very point brings us back to Romans 15, verse 13. The God of hope went into work, and he raised up another, opened another way of sprinkling 
the nations. And that's through the apostleship of Paul. And Paul now, he's come along and he is going to, God is sprinkling, extending his light uh, and glory to the nations now through the ministry of Paul. Let's look at one other verse, Acts 13 real quick, and you'll see this is the beginning of what's called those, his missionary journeys. Look how he describes his ministry here. This is after the fall of Israel, the casting away of Israel. Uh, God has opened up a new avenue of hope, verse 47. For so hath, this is Acts 13, 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee. This is the Lord assigning Paul. I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, a sprinkler of Christ to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So now in the light of Israel's fall, God opens up a new way for the Gentiles. When Israel refused their Christ, what happened to the Gentiles? They stayed in their darkness and uh, in their darkness and rebellion out in the darkness. But what has God done? He doesn't leave them in their hopeless darkness. He raises up Paul and sends him out with a new purpose, a new program, a new people, uh, and he's going to sprinkle them through Paul's ministry now for a new purpose and a new program. It's not, he's not taking the place of Peter and the Twelve or doing what Isaiah said. He's at the very point Isaiah's program broke down. God began a new program to take light to the Gentiles apart from that one. And that's the Apostle Paul. Uh, and so uh, we'll have to end here. Peter, let's get back to our, got to get here for the song anyway. Peter and the Twelve preached the gospel of the kingdom, but their ministry remained primarily to Israel in Jerusalem because Israel rejected that. Uh, Paul's, and that's what we've been reading uh, in Isaiah, Paul mentions it about the, uh, no one believing their report in Romans 10, 15. Paul's ministry went to those who had rejected the gospel of the kingdom uh, who had, or who had never heard it. Uh, and uh, I would love to keep going, but I guess I better wrap it up here. We'll pick it up here next time uh, and show how this would have worked in, in Rome. You can see where this could be a problem in Rome, where you have Jewish believers, believers with a Jewish background, who've been reading Isaiah 52. He's reading Isaiah 52, and it says, don't associate with anything, clean, uh, with anything unclean. Paul comes along and says, there's nothing unclean. You see where the problem can come up. Uh, and they, he's going to show now, you have to build on the right foundation. And we'll show the mechanics of that and maybe the source of the error in Rome. So we'll close with that. Heavenly Father, uh, we're so thankful.